Every now and then, you run across a truly remarkable creature that just, it stands out from the other species in its habitat or in its clade. Perhaps it excels in some physical feat, or maybe it has the most charismatic attitude, or the most colorful or strange appearance. You can count the great snipe among these creatures, owing to the extremes of flight of which it's capable. Now in the past, when great snipes have flown by stationary radar facilities, the birds can be tracked. Their movement speeds are usually pretty steady while they pass through the radar's umbrella, and so it was traditionally thought that they flew at steady cruising speeds. After all, the great snipes have a huge migration route that crosses multiple continents. They have breeding grounds in Scandinavia, which is where they spend the summer, and in the fall, they fly down across the Saharan Desert to settle in the Sahel, a much more temperate strip of grassland running between the desert to the north and the Congo jungle to the south. From here, the birds will fly a 1.5 to 3,000 kilometer circuit over the African continent for much of the winter before eventually coming back north to spend the spring in Eastern Europe. And as the summer rolls around, they find themselves farther north, back up in Scandinavia, for, uh, for the breeding season. This massive thousands of kilometers circuit that these birds fly over Africa is, uh, is done all at once in one 60 to 90 hour trip. It's pretty amazing. Now the radar based research on this is informative, but it's a bit coarse. We get these momentary readings of more or less constant velocity, but we only get them when the birds fly within range of stationary radar facilities. Some scientists from Lund University in Sweden wanted to see if they could measure the migration patterns of the great snipe with higher resolution to uncover any potential unseen details. Now as a quick general aside, this is useful advice for any aspiring scientist. If you want to try and find something surprising that adds nuance or complexity to our understanding of something that we either don't understand that well or that we think we understand pretty well, Look at the methods of data collection that were used to establish our background of knowledge for whatever phenomenon you want to look at. If you look at the data collection methods, you can see what kinds of data they were limited to and the limitations of the interpretation of that data and what that means for our understanding of XYZ phenomenon. So to keep this brief, if you look at the methods that scientists use to learn about something, and you see, hey, this data collection method, yeah, it's useful for learning about, you know, A, B, and C, but we don't quite learn anything about X, Y, and Z from this particular method. Well, what if I look at this same phenomenon, but with different data collection methods that do take into account, that do measure X, Y, Z, you know, whatever variables it happens to be. That's how you can uncover something new. That's how you can add complexity to our understanding of some phenomenon. That's a great way to do it because you're filling in the gaps left behind by imperfect data collection methods. And let's be real, most data collection methods are imperfect. They study one aspect of a larger phenomenon. All right, I'm rambling now, but let's get back to the science news. So the research team, led by Ake Lindstrom, a professor of biodiversity at Lund University, started by capturing some great snipes and attaching small sensor devices to their legs. The great snipes were then released to be free and go along in their migration like normal. The sensor devices would record not just the bird's physical activity and movements, but would also take hourly readings of the local air pressure and temperature. Very quickly, the scientists observed that the great snipes would change their altitude drastically during the day and the night. The great snipes would spend the day flying at very high altitudes, around four to four and a half thousand meters. And then, in the late afternoon, they would descend to a much lower 1.5 to 2.1 thousand meter altitude, where they would cruise through the night until the day came again, which they'd rise back up. Now, because wind speed and temperature fluctuated across day and night, and because this altitude cycle, quote, took place independently of climate zone, topography, and habitat overflown, unquote, the scientists reasoned that the position of the sun might be the important variable here. They reasoned that because none of these other variables, like wind speed, temperature, topography, habitat overflown, seem to have any significant effect on this altitude cycle, they reasoned that the sun's warmth during the day was perhaps why the birds flew so high during the day. 
At these higher altitudes, the air temperature is much cooler than it is near the surface. So the birds would seek the cooler air to counter the warm sunlight and keep themselves cool. So essentially, this day-night fluctuation in altitude is best explained as a form of behavioral temperature regulation. Although the scientists also speculate that these high altitudes during the day may give them a visual advantage when searching for food or resting spots or some kind of landmark. And it may even protect them from predators like eagles by simply flying above where the eagles usually are. On this note, the researchers recorded great snipes flying at higher altitudes than they ever expected. There were repeated incidents of great snipes exceeding 6,000 meters in altitude, and one particularly adventurous individual reached an altitude of 8,700 meters, which apparently is just 150 meters below the height of Mount Everest. That's incredible, because for humans, these altitudes are extreme and inhospitable, to the point of being very quickly lethal. But the great snipes seem to be able to handle it at a physiological level without too many problems. Now this study makes headlines, because this highest flight altitude is actually a record for the great snipe. And this record is on par with the flight altitude records of the bar-headed goose, Anser Indicus. And it's just a kilometer or two under the records of, respectively, the common crane, Grus Grus, and Ruppel's vulture, Gyps ruapellii. All right, so this is a cool little study about a neat little bird that can do some really amazing high altitude and long distance endurance flying. I'll wrap it up with the last line from the paper's summary. The authors write, quote, together with similar recent findings for a small songbird, the great snipe's altitudinal performance sheds new light on the complexity and challenges of migratory flights, unquote. 